Testing, 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 one, two, three. All right, hopefully we are live. Welcome everyone back to another Friday night live stream here at Christ Centered Ironworks. I hope you all have had a great week thus far and uh, hopefully you will have a great weekend after this show is done and over with. So Jessica, how are you doing this evening? I am doing good, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I know our live stream was a little delayed, but maybe it'll still work out for uh, some of you who are on the West Coast. Uh, looks like we're at about 52 viewers so far. So awesome. good evening and welcome, everyone. And uh, also thank you, Hans, for the, being our very first Super Chatter. <laughs> thank you, Hans. We appreciate you, brother. As always, hopefully you and Amy are doing well uh, and the kiddos all the way down there in the isolated South. <laughs> oh, um, anyway, so thank you everyone for being here. Uh, tonight we're going to actually be working on tongs, like I said in the previous live stream uh, that we would be working on. So we're going to be working on making some tongs. The first set of tongs that we're going to end up making this evening are a pair of scrolling tongs. These tongs came from Ken's Custom Iron and they were provided to us by... Couch Forge Company, that's right. So, <laughs> just making sure she knew. So, anyways, yeah, so Couch Forge Company, thank you very much. Um, and then also, so once we get these done, we'll just take and draw a name at random in the comment section down below and we'll ship these anywhere in the world. So, it's an open to worldwide. The only thing you have to do to enter is be here and comment a phrase when we give it to you. So, uh, and that's basically about it. So I'm gonna get these started. We can go to camera number two real quick, Jess. Hopefully you can see that all right. Yep. Look good? Yep. Hopefully that's not too dark. No, too Seems a little dark on this end, but <laughs> on that end it's good? Okay, good. So we're starting with these blanks. I've pre-drilled the blanks. Usually you wouldn't do this. You would forge out whatever you need on the jaws and then drill them later and then put your rivet in them. But, so this way I could save time in the stream and be more efficient, I went ahead and pre-drilled them. Uh, one downside to that is if you pre-drill them before you start forging on them, you've got to be real careful that you don't bend around on this area here because you're just going to end up stretching out that round hole. You'll make it an oval instead of a round hole that you can put um, a rivet through there. So the first step in this process, we're going to draw out the scrolling tongs, draw out the nibs, to a nice taper on each. Get that in the fire. And we'll get right into it here, hopefully. All right, so who do we all have with us this evening, Jess? All right. <laughs> I was floating myself back to the other corner there because I was right above where you stand when you're um, doing with the forge. So I, I moved that live, last stream. So now you can see Roy's face at least <laughs> while he's um, working in there. We have Wayne Heights. We have Manga12, B&B Forge, Rob O'Leary, Jared Scheidel, uh, Chubbs Outdoors, uh, Chuck Steers, um, just to name a few. Awesome. Well, welcome, welcome. Welcome everyone to the stream. Good to have y'all. Also, thank you, Yamez, for the moustache super sticker. <laughs> <laughs> the moustache. Thank you, Yamez, brother. I appreciate it. Oh, also, I did get your message earlier. I have failed to reply today. It's just been one of those days for me. So I will get back with you after the stream. <laughs> Yamez at Isla Metal Forge is always a big supporter of ours. And so we are a big supporter of his. And uh, thank you, brother, for being here. Greatly appreciate you taking time out amongst your busy schedules. Be here. Dad Rats Forge, thank you for the super chat. Says hello, Roy, Jess, in the live stream mafia here from uh, here in Essex, England, UK. Hey, Dad Rats, good to have you here, and thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. So. Veteran Iron and Wood says, I really like that you have been revisiting the basics lately. Oh, good, good. Um, well, to just be honest with you, that's kind of, a, that's kind of my cheater's way out of uh, producing content right now. <laughs> because uh, yeah, I've got a full plate on me. 
So uh, I'm glad people have been enjoying that, which is good. Um, I have got an entire fundamental series that I've made on YouTube, and it's all in a playlist. But again, it doesn't necessarily get all the traction in the world uh, because it's just older content. So there are a lot of videos there in the fundamentals playlist that you may want to go check out if you're digging the fundamental series as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying the I'm glad you're enjoying the fundamental content. Uh, I do like teaching the fundamentals. Of course, I'm real big on teaching fundamental forging practices and everyone getting a firm foundation in that first and foremost. So there's gonna be quite a few more videos I've got coming, uh, even fundamental scroll work. There's some of that stuff coming up, you know, in the next several weeks or for the rest of this month, just about while I work on some other uh, new content and hope well and get a lot of orders out the door get those processed hopefully hopefully that'll all work out okay so let's go to camera number two Jess our first jaw is nice and hot we're gonna focus right on the tip here and just draw that out to paper Nice taper. We're not going to go super long with this and narrow. So we want to keep it somewhat rigid as this is just mild steel. If this was made from higher carbon material, you could probably get away with making that a nice long thin taper but because this is made for mild steel you need to leave a little bit of thickness into it so it can resist the torque of you twisting steel with it. It's a good pair of scrolling tongs. Really the only prerequisite on this is that you make these good and round. And there you have it. There's one jaw. Now we just gotta make the other one look exactly like it. Hopefully they can see that okay. All that looking good? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Got a little bit more of a area I wanna clean up there. Wasn't quite as smooth as I would like to see. There we have it, looks nice. Nice and clean. That's the way we want it. Nice and clean forging. All right, I'll set that off to the side and I will get the other piece heated up and go back to the main cam. Have we got any questions, comments? Some of all of the above. <laughs> oh, yeah, not the last two yet. <laughs> yet. Yet, yeah. Uh, Rob Huff says a little something to offset this shipping cost he sent a $15 super chat he says looking forward to seeing you guys in a few weeks um oh, yes Rob, thank you. yeah we do have uh, there's still some spots available in that class um it's august 29th and 30th i think it's that it's that weekend it's a saturday sunday um so yeah and it'll be on floral forms for anybody who is willing to travel to the cincinnati ohio area yep Ought to be a pretty good class. I look forward to seeing you too, Rob. Thank you for the $15 super chat. Greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. What? Yes, uh, Heath Miller with $5 super chat says, keep up the great work. Looking forward to working with you in a couple of months. Uh, yeah, we look forward to meeting you too, Heath. That's gonna be a, a, it's real great when students can come out for a private class and have a lot more one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to meeting you as well. Mr. Coffee, thank you for the $20 super chat. He says, evening folks, hope all is well with you and yours. Woohoo! Mr. Coffee, honored as always, sir. Thank you for the $20 super chat. Greatly appreciate it. Hopefully you're doing well as well. 
saw an Instagram photo from you. Uh, I think I think it was Inst yeah, it was Instagram. It was an Instagram photo where you uh, had posted about uh, someone putting a filter. <laughs> an automaker putting a filter in the ring of fire there in between the manifold on the on the engine <laughs> i've had to change filters like that before and it sucks every time so uh, definitely feel for you <laughs> hopefully your knuckles aren't too burned rob huff says he has to come home with the flower because his wife's birthday is that monday Woo. Well, we will get you taken care of, sir. We will make sure you come home with a flower. For sure, for sure. So, all right, let's go back to the anvil, Jess. Nice and hot. Again, focusing on that tip. Trying to get this to look about regular. Round that up. Then plane the shit up on the anvil. Hope this is going to come out looking right. We shall see. I will have to grab that other one. That's what we got so far. We'll, whoop. Gotta drop it. Grab that. Grab the other one. What I'm checking for here is length, the differences in length. I want to make sure they're somewhat e even and equal. This one here, it looks like I need to draw out just a bit more, get a little more of the thickness out of it, and then that'll, that'll come up just nicely to the other one. So, so this one's all right, so we can stop hammering on it. We'll put the other one back in the fire and lengthen the taper just ever so slightly and that'll get that up to where it needs to be. So this one's fine. We'll put the original one back in the fire and get a little more drawn on that taper. That's really the kind of the main thing. You want to have the tapers look similar in length. You want them to be about similar in length. Of course you can always grind one down if it's a little too long and we most certainly might do that with this one if it's a little too narrow up at the tip. But we're going to draw the other one out just to fuzz to match. Questions, Jess? Comments? Yeah. We have one here. Uh, from Gordon Farmer, he asked earlier, how can I bend the tongs without a vise? Bend the tongs with other tongs. Um, or vise grips. You can clamp it in vise grips and go like that. If you've got two pairs of vise grips, clamp it on either side of the boss and then twist it like that. Um, that will be done in something like this. And you're, you know, if you get one of these twist jaw type tongs, you just clamp one end of the boss with a pair of vise grips and you clamp the other end of the bit right there with a pair of vise grips and then just give it a twist like that. Um, it's just muscle power. If you get it hot enough, it's not too difficult to do uh, just by being up in free air space. You have a little bit, le little bit less leverage that way, but it still works out pretty darn good that way. So, all right, let's go back to the anvil, Jess. Come on. Just draw this out just a bit more. Just so that more matches the other one. There. Now that's a lot better. And now back to planishing that out. Mm. 
great question, Gordon Farmer, by the way. Um, yeah, not everyone has a vise, so you just kind of have to muscle and willpower it into shape when you don't have a vise available to you. And in fact, I'll show you that when we make these so I don't have to move the camera around. Hopefully that'll work good. I think those look good. Yeah, those are exactly alike. So that's what we were looking for. Two exactly alike. All right. Yeah, so I don't have to move the cameras around. We can go back to main cam. So I don't have to move the cameras around. I know I've said that for the fourth time now. I will go ahead and twist it without the vise, just so you can see how that gets done. I'm just going to use a pair of tongs and twist it that way uh, versus the vise grip method. But the vise grips will be a little easier because you can clamp one and then you can kind of fiddle with the other one to get where you want it and twist a little bit easier. If you're twisting with tongs, you have to be able to squeeze pretty good and tight on the tongs because when you add that torsion pressure, it's going to want to open the jaws on your tongs. Um, so it's a lot to kind of keep squeezed in hand uh, if you catch my meaning there. So, all right, so those look good. I'm going to cool off these ends. Usually I would let those cool down for a little bit. But in this case, we're going to just cool that end off enough that I can grip it on the other side with my tongs here. And then we can draw out the handle material itself. Now you don't have to work on jaw first, then tong rein. In fact, in a lot of ways, it can be a little bit more advantageous if you work on the, if you work on the tong rein first, then flip it around and use, and then work on the jaw um, itself. It can be a little bit handier in these short tongs cases. Questions, Jess? Yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, yes, these tongs are from, uh, I'm drawing a blank now, Ken's Ken's, custom yeah, Ken's Custom Iron. Um, if anybody is interested in buying some, I have like the refer a friend link down below and it gets you either a percentage or several dollars off or something like that. Um, so that's down in the description if you are interested. And uh, Bernie, Ernie Beeswick asked what thickness the material was to start with. Um, the material thickness is... Great question. Before I lie, why don't I just measure it? I've got a tape measure right here. They do range a little bit, but Ken's is, looks to be, choo -choo -choo -choo. it's kind of just a touch over three eighths of an inch thick, but just call it three eighths. Three eighths inch plate is what it was probably cut out of. Pretty hefty duty tong. Pretty hefty duty tong. Doe Creek Forge sent $5 um, and said, don't skip the Roy rant, which was followed by Charming Hollow Forge, $20 super chat, who says, Roy, at what point does one consider themselves and achieve to be an artist smith? Rant in three, two, one. <laughs> okay, you have to rephrase that question, what? <laughs> so first of all, first off, let me say thank you for the super chats. Greatly appreciate it. One for a Roy rant and also, Mr. Charming Hollow Forge for <laughs> egging it on. <laughs> so the question was, at what point does one consider themselves or achieve the status of an artist smith? Achieve the status of an artist smith, huh? Yep. <laughs> when you can buffalo people, buffalo people enough into believing that you're good enough to be in a gallery which isn't too difficult these days. So, <laughs> I don't know if I want to go down that road too far. <laughs> oh, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to the artistry side of blacksmithing, let me look at this real quick, make sure I'm not burning anything up. Okay, I've got a minute or so I can talk there. When it comes to being able to call yourself an artist, um, I guess it's kind of like being able to call yourself a blacksmith. There's going to be different tiers of that, right? Like if you're just beginning or you're just a, a budding artist or a budding blacksmith, then you just have to be honest with yourself where you're at. 
there are skilled blacksmiths and unskilled blacksmiths alike out there. Just like in artistry, there are skilled artists and unskilled artists out there um, just the same. The big difference is, is a lot of times when you look at art, it is often said, oh, well, you know, art is basically subjective, right? Like it's, it's, oh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's subject, it's subjective to, you know, the people who are looking at it. You know, they can say, ah, I don't, I think that's, is it objective or subjective? I think it's subjective. I think I'm saying that right. But basically what, what it boils down to is someone can say, oh, that's art. And another person might go around and say, nope, that's a Porter John. So it's, it's really based upon beauty is in the eye of the beholder when it comes to art these days. Now, that means that somebody with really low skill, as in they have really no clue about what they're doing, they're just out there throwing paint at a canvas, can be considered an artist. Likewise, likewise, someone who can paint, there's one guy I follow, he is an Italian painter, and his work is just, it's mind-boggling realistic. And he is also an artist. So that's a very skilled artist. And then you got the people out there putting a little Hindu dot in the center of paper somewhere and calling that art. So, you know, blacksmithing is very similar to that because I have seen people with forged art that wasn't actually very skilled. And I used to be one of those people. And I've exhibited in galleries just because I got started into blacksmithing. Um, and I was trying to make a living at it and trying to make a business. I kind of went the art gallery route and my original work I put in art galleries wasn't that great. And the more and more skilled I got, the more and more upset I got at the fact that when I didn't win any blue ribbons or whatever because someone else's art beat me out. Um, and so, so yeah, so, th so that's kind of a balance. I would say it's, it's more about your attitude towards your pieces. If you're, trying to commit, if you're trying to convey more of a message and more from a sculptural standpoint, that's more of the artist type blacksmithing or that you could consider yourself an artist blacksmith because you're trying to convey a, a message, an emotion, a feeling, a certain feel to a certain audience. Um, and I guess that's how I would make that classification of when you can consider yourself an artist blacksmith is when you yourself have felt that you have achieved that. Does that make you a skilled blacksmith? No. Does that make you a skilled artist? No. Um, may not even make you a great craftsman. It's just, it's just that point in which you can say, okay, this is what I kind of side with. This is my group of people. I'm the guy that wears the neckerchief and the little bray, what, what do they call those, a, a bray? A beret, yeah, a beret hat, you know, and a little neckerchief, and you eat tea and crumpets on the weekend, and you know, stuff like that, and stare at white paintings that are just all white, and say, oh, such feel, such depth of emotion. Then you're, <laughs> then you're on the artist side of it. Um, oftentimes, those those that are the most skilled out there, they don't consider themselves artists or whatever. That they, they just they, they look at the piece and they let the piece speak for itself, whatever they're working on. Whether that's they're forging an, an axle for somebody or they're doing whatever, they just let their work speak for their skills and things like that. Good question. Yeah, that is a great question. I'd say one other thing you could add to that rant or list probably is um, whether it serves a function, like if it's a usable piece. Um, versus, I mean, some usable pieces, like, uh, they serve a function, like a hook, you know, like the main purpose of it is that it's a hook. And if it, you do make it artistic, that's more of a secondary thing versus art pieces are normally considered just art only. They don't necessarily have a function. So let's go to the anvil, Jess. No. Going to draw out these tong reins. At least on this tong. Mm. 
I'm gonna leave like a little bit of a nub on the end, on these pair, just to make them a bit different. For no other reason. We're gonna radius them off. Grab this again. I like thought provoking questions like that. It's always good to have. is getting too cold to play around with. So I'm gonna stick it back in the fire. Another question from the po Provo Pilot. Pirate, sorry, I'm getting all tongue, tongue twisted. The Provo Pirate. I have officially started my blacksmith business. Uh, fed and state paperwork done, starting on the city. What is the best tip for selling at events such as farmer's markets, run fairs, etc., etc., etc. can you give? Well, that was a lot in that question. Yes. Best tips for selling, selling in anywhere in the world. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay, selling, selling in person. Um, presentation is key. People go to Hobby Lobby because they like the smell of the store. Presentation is key. Um, not that you can't buy any of the stuff that was made in Taiwan on the internet readily. People shop at Hobby Lobby because of the smell of the store, the presentation, the ability to walk around and touch things, right? So when you are selling in public to the public, it's all about how do you want to be represented? When you're first starting out, you probably ain't got a lot of budget to be able to make it all flashy and whatnot, but the more of you that you can add into your display, so, you know, nice, handmade display tables maybe, or little display shelves that you can highlight your ironwork that you're doing. If you can demonstrate, again, the process, who you are, that presentation and being able to present will really help your sales a lot when it comes to selling in person at craft shows or craft fairs and things like that. Um, it's not the single most important thing to do, but it is a very important thing to do. It will allow you to make an upfront connection with the customer, and you might hand out a boatload of business cards and only maybe get two callbacks, but you never know. Every now and then you'll have another person say, hey, I saw you at a, a fair you know, three years ago. Do you still do blacksmithing? I have this item that I would love made. Um, and you can choose to take a job like that way or not. But it really kind of comes down to presentation. Where I see a lot of people fall short is you put up the plastic white table, you lay your black iron goods on it, and then you sit back and you cross your arms in your chair and you wait for people to come by your booth. There's no reason for them to come by their booth. And then as you sit there, you get frustrated because people keep looking at your table but then walking on by. And before you know it, you don't know it, but you got this disgruntled look on your face. And they're like, I'm not going to stop at that angry blacksmith's booth. So again, presentation. It's all about presentation when you are selling at fairs or art shows or anything like that. It's all about how you present yourself um, in your business. So that's, ju that's just how it is, you know? Light some poopery while you're out there and... <laughs> Potpourri. Oh, that's how you say it. It's not poopery. No? All right. <laughs> About that time we need the smiley poop emoji, huh? Uh, the poopery. Sure so, um, but, but yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so, you know, light some incense. There you go. Or, or do something. Um, 
again, it's all about creating ambiance, feel. A lot of stores, retail stores, they go into a lot of work to try to display some of their best items up front to kind of, that's your, that's your billboard, the front of your storefront, right? To pull people in. Then once you get them in there, then you want to show them that not all your items are $30,000. You've got some knickknacks they can go home with, right? Uh, you got the poopery burning in the back, you know? The place smells good. Um, the lighting is set. It's, you know, the mood is set for that. Uh, that's, the best, that's the best advice I can add into it, is set an atmosphere. If you're a fun, casual person, set a fun, casual environment for people to come into so they really get the best of you. Um, you know, it's not putting on a show, it's not putting on a fake face, it's putting on what's the best of you, right? So you're just kind of over-exaggerating your own personality. So if you're, really, if you're really chill and you like to, you know, just hang out and make it a nice sitting area where people can come have their lunch and stuff and maybe buy something from you, right? Uh, go down those kind of thought processes, right? Hopefully that helps. Yeah. We can go back to the anvil. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> All right. All right, just gonna round these up. <laughs> well, there's no help for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're a jerk. You've got other problems than sales. <laughs> you should probably get with your camp counselor about that. The what? <laughs> They're not letting that go? No. Says he has a puppy that can fly all of your <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. They're never going to let me live that one down, huh? Uh, maybe my this? These characters? <laughs> no. no way they'll forget my next stream. <laughs> They'll be saying all these comments and everybody in that stream will be like, who are these people? Like, ah, oh, they're the regulars. All right, that's all done. Let's see what we got here. See it? Yep. Cool. Cool. Hopefully everybody thinks it looks good. Doesn't really matter because I'm giving them away, so. <laughs> you're gonna get you're gonna get what you get. Whether you like it or not. Because this isn't an ambiance thing here. <laughs> I'm a jerk. <laughs> I'm that jerk we're talking about. <laughs> no poopery for you. All right. All right. Question, uh, serious question for you from Hans says, do you think a majority of current full-time Smiths got their big break job that pushed them into full time, or did it just did it take forever and just decide to go full time once they got enough of a workload? Both, both Hans. Great question, by the way. Um, yeah, it's it's really both. There's Smiths that have done that way where they just kind of slowly, casually build up to it, and they were just like, "Why am I working at my day job?" And then they just quit and went into it full time. And then there's others that had a large contract fall into their hands and they said, you know what, I'm only gonna live once, I'm gonna go for it. They might have already been smithing for a lot of years, just doing it as a hobby. And they said, you know what, I'm gonna go for this. This is gonna take me a year to complete this job. And in that time, I'll try to sell some other work. And then that's, that's how they got off onto that. Um, probably, the, probably the larger majority, I would say, of full-time smiths, probably got into it the first way where they got so busy at home that they could say okay you know what i'm just going to go off this direction now um, that's most likely then you've got a whole other subsect where they weren't really 
they kind of just had it dropped in their lap, so to speak. You know, it's kind of like they had an opportunity, everything was kind of already set up for them, and they took over some other business that was already booming or, or, or that was already built for them. There's those two. So that, those are kind of the rare exceptions, not necessarily the rule there. Um, when it comes down to it, you know, when it comes right down to it, I would rather be, you know, instead of having a large job dropped in my lap and then that be the thing that makes me makes or breaks me as a smith, I would rather build up into it over time. You kind of earn it that way um, versus, you know, you get a taste for, say, a $60,000 contract to do something and then your next job's, you know, 2500 bucks. It's going to be like, whoa, what happened? Well, there's not that many people out there needing $65,000 worth of work done. That's what happens. And you see a lot of little startup forges that are around for two, three years, and then they just crash and burn. And it's because they were doing really well in one department. And they got a bunch of labor, and they got a bunch of overhead, and they, got, they bought the fanciest 10,000 square foot building in downtown Seattle and, and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And then those jobs don't come through the door like they need on the monthly basis. And then before you know it, they just, they, they, they drop off the face of the map. So, and, and that's, kind of, that's kind of a, it's a good proxy to life, isn't it? You know, Gains that are usually gotten quickly are very quick to vanish just as well, right? So um, they don't have to be ill-gotten gains. They can be perfectly acquired legally, but usually um, fast money is both fast in and fast out the door too as well. So uh, it takes a long while to build up a client base, but once you build up a good client base, and when I talk about client base, I'm talking about good word of mouth business to where someone says, hey, where did you get that garden trellis from? Oh, well, I bought it from this guy. Look him up. Okay. And then there's some Google search results for you. And then before you know it, you know, you're doing this and you're over at this show and you're done over here and you expose yourself out there on the market a bunch. And then eventually your business builds up to where it's very sustainable. And then there's not always, there's another great thing. No one's asked me this question but I'm gonna put it out there for those that are trying to make it as a full-time income and a career. There are gonna be months where you are going to swear that you made the wrong choice and that it's all over and you need to close the business. Now certainly, there's a lot of times that that may be true for some people, but that is actually not true for most. When most people quit and give up, is usually when they needed to stick to their guns and ride it out for another month or two and they would have been in the largest job of their life. There's been so many times where the good Lord above has come along and swooped in and saved us from just absolute financial collapse in our household um, just by no fault of our own, just no sales. You know, you go three, four months without sales in a business. Some would argue you don't have a business. But that's the nature of the beast when you're catering to upscale clientele or you're catering to the weekend warrior. If there's no shows to go to, there's no sales, but your bills don't stop, right? So, so there's been plenty of times where we've had that over the years and, and in every time it was just right around the river bend. You know, you just got right around the river bend and boom, something came over, something hit, some bills got paid, you were starting to cook in with grease again, and there you go. You know, you, you start really getting up and, and going. So let that be a little encouragement to you if you're going through a lull, not saying Hans is, but if you are starting your blacksmithing business and right now you feel like maybe you're in that spot and you're just like, oh man, just nothing selling and I thought I was gonna sell all my tomahawks this weekend and I only sold two, and, but I spent this much. You're going to have months and you're going to have weeks that are like that um, and it's just, it's, just part of, it's just part of the beast. It's just the nature of the beast. So Sometimes it requires you thinking outside the box, selling some sneakers or something on eBay or whatever you gotta do to keep yourself in the game of being self-employed. And then that next big contract hits and that supplies you for a while. And then all of a sudden you get 
that done and then there's nothing and there might be an empty lull and eventually, you know, again, it'll hit again, you know, so um, there's a lot we could go into on that one, but, but yeah, there are definitely, there are definitely people out there that they just made the plunge regardless and, uh, and it panned out well for them. They got some sort of contract and it worked out well and they're still blacksmiths to this day, but that's few and far between comparatively to the guys that built a long, well-built business from the ground up. So. All right, good. And I, there was a bunch of super chats. I'm, I apologize. Have you got those on a list, Jess? I'll mention those real quick and then we'll get to hammering here. Um, one was from Clam Smasher who says, I want one of those things. I think he's talking about the potpourri. <laughs> So thank you for the, the super chat, Clam Smasher. We're not giving away free potpourri, though. No. <laughs> and the other one was from Graham, who says, Hey, Roy and Jessica, I made more sales this week. Uh, still owe all to you guys. That's five weeks in a row selling. My shed is nearly done. Then I can start a new line of items. My mind is active with ideas. Awesome, Graham. So glad to hear it. Oh, and who was Clam Smasher? Clam Smasher, thank you for the super chats. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Grant, you're more than welcome, brother. And, uh, you know, we can only put, sow the seeds of inspiration. It's up to you entirely to get it done. So, so give yourself a big pat on the back as well. Um, awesome, awesome. Glad to hear that your mind's going crazy with ideas. That's a good thing. All right, and go to the anvil. Probably doing more talking than I'm doing hammering. All right, get this all straightened up. Corners off. All right, so there you go. We're out to get that hot again. Just drawing out the same length. And we'll ram that thing up. We're almost ready to put a ribbon in it. All right, what do we got, Jess? Let's see here. Uh, we have Scott Brown who says, where can I get my hands on coal these days aside from the ex expensive Amazon coal? <laughs> Um, if you just type your location, generally, your general location, I'm sure there's plenty of people in the comment section that can help you out, point you in a direction. There's a really good community here that uh, can help point you in the right direction for your location. So my biggest advice, if you're just new and you're just finding blacksmithing for the first time, and you're excited, don't know where to go, Google blacksmithing groups near you and go to one of those. The information there will be invaluable to you to show you where to go pick up steel, where to get coal at, things like that. Get connected with your local blacksmithing group. Um, most of the people in local blacksmithing groups are great guys, so about 98% of them. Gordon Farmer says, is it good to find an area in the market that no one has ever thought of blacksmithing? Well, if you find that, Gordon, let me know. <laughs> um, usually that's not, that's not possible. It's not possible to find a place in the market where uh, no one's already thought of that thing that you're doing. Um, you can add your own spin, your own twist to it, but unless you're doing something that is ridiculously technical hard to do, 
uh, there's not really a way of distancing yourself from the pack, so to speak, when it comes to that. If you're making an S-hook, an S-hook's an S-hook that's an S-hook. So it's no different buying an S-hook from a guy in the United States as it is from buying one in Pakistan or India or anywhere else. An S-hook is an S-hook that's an S-hook. There's not that much that you can do with them. Now, if your S-hook has like 24 karat gold inlay in it and all this other craziness, well, now that's getting to the level of obscene and absurd, and therefore, there's only gonna be A, only so many people who would know how to do that, B, only so many people who, are, who know how to do that that would be skilled enough to pull it off, and then D, you know, there's only gonna be so many people in that market space to buy an S-hook like that. And that's where you would find yourself into doing something that not a lot of other people are doing. But when it comes down to just right down to item to item, whatever that is, say a shelf bracket, just about any competent smith can make a shelf bracket. That's basically it. So the only thing that you can add is your own flourishments to it and your own difficulties, your own, um, your own artistic eye to that. Add your own elements to it, so to speak. But shelf brackets have been made since the dawn of time. Um, <laughs> well, since people have been needing shelves, basically, and have went to a blacksmith to have them done. So, yeah, when it comes to that sort of thing, again, like I said, the only thing that distances you from say the rest of the blacksmiths out there, if you want to look at it that way, is how difficult that item is to reproduce. And that's about it. Good question, I like that question. We ready to go to the anvil? Sure. And we can take some more super chats, by the way. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Yamez, who says, how do you keep up with the videos when you're busy? I am amazed, I just can't keep up, LOL. Yamez, great question. So how do I keep up with my videos when I'm so busy? The way that I keep up with my videos while being so busy is basically I batch shoot videos or I do content where I might spend a week or so actually filming content for the channel and then I edit all that footage down and then I schedule out my videos. So when I release a video at you know, 6 p.m., that's not me actually sitting behind the keyboard releasing that video. I might still be in my shop working my butt off. There's a, there's a schedule feature on YouTube to do that. I just schedule a video to be released. And then once that video releases, then we find out how well it does, so on and so forth like that. But yeah, definitely use the schedule feature on YouTube. It's a life changer, especially when you can't be around. The funny thing, and we'll better not talk about them too much, they'll probably shut the stream down. The funny thing about, well, I'll just say it right now, the funny thing about YouTube is YouTube's an evil mistress. She really is. Um, basically, if you don't keep up with your posting, it takes forever to get your numbers back. And that means numbers of subscribers on the daily, that's the numbers of views per video, that's the, they stop, they stop pushing your content to your subscriptions, they do all sorts of things against you if you don't keep that ball, if you don't kick that can and keep it rolling downhill. They will, are you at the anvil or main cam? You're at the anvil? Okay, well I'm talking to the main cam, so. All right, this is all done, so there, that's, that's done. We'll let those cool for a minute. We got those set up nicely. Hopefully everybody's getting excited about this little giveaway here. We're on the main cam. Cool, all right. So I'll let those cool down for a second naturally. I get that, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So, so yeah, so if you don't keep up on, <coughs> a, lot, a lot of people think YouTube is a great place to be and that would be a great place to earn a living and everything else. Um, it's gonna be how bad, almost as bad of a taskmaster as your boss at your day job, um, if not worse, because the internet doesn't sleep, basically. Um, depending on where you find yourself in content and, and what type of content you're making. Since I make tutorials and a lot of stuff like that, 
educational content, it's not as important for me to stay relevant right up to date minute by minute. If you made more news or reaction type content on YouTube, uh, two other things that are going on, you've got to be constantly making content uh, and, and stay in that cycle. Because as soon as you get out of that cycle, you're out for a long time till you get back. So, so we, we start doing basically scheduled videos where we'll schedule them out and you know, might have four or five days worth of content uh, scheduled out in advance. And in this particular case, I went ahead and got up about 20 days worth of content scheduled out in advance in order for me to have time to actually work on my day job uh, projects here at the shop. It is a very difficult balance and it's one that I would like to say I'm like excellent at, but I'm not. I'm better than most. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds bad. I would say I'm, I'm, I'm not average at it, I'm good. Right? I'm, I'm good usually at time management and things like that in the shop, but there is that element where sometimes I just can't post because there's other stuff going on in my life that means more to me than posting videos. So, uh, so, that, so that does happen from time to time. But if you're on YouTube and you can schedule out video posts, definitely do that. Make up four or five, schedule them out, give yourself some space to be able to make more content and be able to work on life issues that all human beings have. And uh, you will be a lot happier in the long run uh, if, if you do. That'll have one caveat to that though. I will say it is a lot more difficult to keep up with comments and comment section when you do do that though. Because I may need, say instead of me taking six months off YouTube, because that's how much space I need to keep up with my regular work, Instead of doing that, it appears like I'm on YouTube, constant, right? I'm constantly there. And so some people can get kind of chuffed if I don't reply to them uh, via the comment section. But one human being against 60 plus thousand. So <laughs> there's just not enough of me, not enough of Roy to go around uh, when it comes to those sort of things. So, so yeah, so that's, that's one downside, right? I mean, that's... It's, it's worth mentioning because some of you out there may have said, well, what's wrong with Roy these days? He hasn't answered my questions. It's like, well, because Roy is like, beep, leave a message after the tone. You know, Roy is in another world right now. <laughs> he, is, he is a really busy dude that doesn't even know who he is as a human being. You know, so there's, so there's that. <laughs> Good question. Jay Rock had asked um, if you thought there was a marketplace for bladesmiths and uh, blacksmiths in America currently. Oh yeah, it's wide open. There's a huge, I mean, there's, a, there's tons of space for, if you're getting started and you're wanting to make, make a living at blacksmithing, now couldn't be a better time to probably do it. Well, a better time would have been about two and a half-ish years ago, that would have been probably the best or the, the peak time to start catching the wave of interest in blacksmithing. Um, but even with that being said, it's still a good time to be alive, let alone uh, be a blacksmith, especially here in America, uh, for bladesmithing or otherwise. There's a ton of interest. Tons of people want to both do the craft or interested in the craft have respect, newfound respect for people who are at the top of the craft. Um, so it's a really good time to be a bladesmith or be a blacksmith in, the, in this world's economy, it, it really is. So uh, there are some people, you'll find those, those naysayers. I found plenty when I first got started in it. And later on, those same guys that were like, ah, you'll never make it in this. Uh, that, that time was back in the 80s and you just, you missed the boat by 20 years and blah, blah, blah. Like, those guys turned around, were end up learning from me when I go teach at stuff and demonstrate at events, blacksmithing events. So, and asking questions about the orders that I'm selling constantly because uh, you'll find that a lot of times, a lot of times if someone, if, that guy couldn't make it as a blacksmith, 
They're usually pretty negative about being a professional blacksmith, even though there's thousands of professional blacksmiths out there now today, comparatively to when I first started doing it for a profession. There's a lot more professional blacksmiths now, which is a good thing. It's a good thing than what there was. I'll figure out how to put these together. Makes sense. Well, that's the only way to do them, but I'll have to do a little bit more adjusting on those to get them right where I want them, but that'll be okay. We got an anvil. And if you've got questions, now's an appropriate time to ask said things. Yeah, just uh, a little bit of comment still going on about YouTube there. Um, some some people, they say, uh, here's Caitlin from Orbors. She says, YouTube is, for me, is fun. I make videos because I want to. No intention of turning it into a business. Uh, I may not even monetize it. That's definitely, that's definitely good. That's definitely good when you can do that. And for certain, if, if you're going to do YouTube, that's a great, great thing, Caitlin. Hey, by the way, welcome. Good to have you here. Um, that's a great thing. You don't get to the point of putting out over 1,400 videos on YouTube for free, though. That's not usually how it works. So that, that requires a certain level of time investment that you have to end up making something back for your efforts at a certain point of time. And I guess when you see people who get to a certain level where they've got a certain level of production and stuff, it's, it's kind of like that natural progression or evolution of being on YouTube, if you will. Um, if you would just want to do it as a hobby, there's definitely people who do that, but you'll also notice they don't post but maybe once a month. They might post once a week or whenever, right? It's when they have the time, when they feel like it, and things like that. When you're building something on YouTube, if you're going to do something and you care about actually getting somewhere on YouTube or you got to get, you know, it, you want to get one day have sponsorships and whatever to build those type of audiences and stuff it requires a level of push to put out content that then becomes uns unsustainable for hobby uh, for doing it as a hobby it's kind of like in blacksmithing is very similar to that um, you know you might start with making a few trinkets and then hey, your neighbors think those trinkets are cool, and they ask for you to make them some more, and they'll willing to pay you, and you agree on a price, and then the neighborhood gets around you, and all of a sudden you've got a whole community maybe who's asking for trinkets, and they all want to come to you to get some cool Christmas present, right, or something like that. And then, you're, again, you've got all this work at home to do now, and then you have your day job. And so that's where you see people that they have to make that choice. Am I going to just stay as a hobby? And as hobbyist, that means I need to ramp down production when I get home so I can still have a life. Or am I going to do this as a profession? So I'm going to ramp this up so I can ramp down what I do at work at my main day job. So this becomes my main day job. So there's always this teetering scale of balance. Well, YouTube is very similar to that. So YouTube is great great for anybody. Anybody who wants to get on YouTube and share some knowledge, that's, that's awesome. And then there's some people that they get 40 million subscribers and they've got three videos on their channel. I mean, there, there's cases like that, but those are usually the anomaly. The people that you see that have usually tens of thousands of subscribers, those people have usually went to doing something of a business model where you're doing something on the regular basis, something that people can count on that is a sustainable thing. So that's, that's, very, that's a difficult thing, especially when you've got life, right? <laughs> you, you've got life to do. So it, it's, a, it's a tricky balance, but that's a valid point about just doing it for, um, you know, just doing it for a hobby because, yeah, at that point, time, and time between you posting doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't. You can do whatever you feel like when you have fun, when you want to do it. So oh, it works out pretty good. Questions, yes. comments? Com no. Um, no. No. Uh, Heath Miller asks, what generally inspires you in your blacksmithing work? What generally inspires me in blacksmithing? 
15th century France. That's, that, that basically inspires me. Or basically anywhere in Europe in the 15th century when ironwork was going through a renaissance. Um, yeah. Pro uh, maybe 13th to 15th century. I mean, it was a range, right? Like, it was a range. But, but yeah, th there was a pinnacle there, I believe, in smithing that the, smith the smiths of today have not even come close to competing with. Um, even with all of our modern technology that we have, uh, the amount of detail and level of ironwork, you know, when labor was cheap back in the day and you could have a thousand people working on a, on a gate, right, for you, and craftsmen, you know, and, and stuff like that, and it was just a trade, like, man, the ironwork that they were putting out is just amazing. So one of my favorite smiths beyond Tom Latney, uh, who is alive and present, thank God, still love that, love that man. So, sorry, man crush on there on Tom Latney. If you don't know Tom Latney, you should. You should Google his name right now. <laughs> Google his work. Yep, Tom Latney, blacksmith, Pepin, Wisconsin. Google his work. Uh, really inspires me, real great guy. I've done several little internships and things underneath him and week-long classes and whatnot. Um, and, yeah, I can't say enough, say enough about Tom, but he's, a, he's one that really inspires me. But one that's since long passed on that really inspires me as well is Cyril Kolnick works. I think it's Kolnick. It might be, I'm just going to say it Kolnick. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, but it's Cyril Kolnick. I don't know if Jessica's typing that up. Are you? No. Okay, she's typing over there. I'm, I'm wondering why, what, what she's typing. Um, okay, she's answered the question. Good. That, his work really inspires me as well. Um, and then basically anything with Baroque. Sorry, that's a faucet. You ask me what inspires me. A lot of things is, inspire me in blacksmithing, um, and they influence the direction that I want to go with my work when I undertake jobs and pieces. Not always do I get to do what I want to do because I'm working for customers and clients, but I can always push my own agenda just a little bit. <laughs> oh. All right, we good? Do we need to answer any super chats? Are they good? We got them all topped up? We're good. They're just fighting over. <laughs> if, if you were to have an apprentice, who it would be and for what reason? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're fighting over if I had an apprentice, yes. who would it why, be and for what reason? Why they would make the best apprentice. Oh, why they would make the best apprentice. I see. I see. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, that's one thing that maybe, maybe someday that might happen. I don't know. My work right now is really focused on high skill, low volume. So in order to have apprentices, you need to have a balance of both high volume and decent skill too, right? So um, you got to have enough skill in it so this way it's neat enough that somebody wants to buy it and then your work stands out. But you also have to have a high volume enough turnover of jobs that you can not have 15 guys standing around with their hands in their pants going, so, what are we making today, boss? And you're like, um, I don't know. Go over there and sweep the floor. You know, so, there, <laughs> so, so there's, there's that balance there. Um, there, are some, there are some guys out there that are doing iron work, doing, I'd say, more forge fab stuff or mostly fab with some forging out there. There's some ornamental companies out there that you can get, get an apprenticeship under, too, as well which could also be good if you're serious about those sort of things, other than just joking about being my apprentice. <laughs> All right, we ready? We are. Questions? We're good? Yeah. We're good. We're done. We're, we're good. We go? We go? We know. Yes, go. Go? No. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, go. All right. Go, go. So I'm going to give away some sticker packs. You'll get what you see here. <laughs> Can they see that okay? Should I go down to camera number two? Yeah, there we go. Bam. You'll get to get a package of stickers like this. That's upside down. That's a bit sacrilegious. We don't want to do that now, do we? <laughs> we'll keep that right side up. Um, so we've got the coveted Year of the Anvil sticker, which is the year of giving away anvils, which we will be doing in the next live stream that we do. And then we've got a brand new one here. And all these were provided to us by Dana Maggiore. So thank you so much. Make sure to give him a hand clap of applause down in the comment section down below. And then, so we've got this new one here, which is nice. It's a more square, rectangular type uh, 
uh, sticker, really good. This one here allows you to see some colors behind it. Uh, the backdrop is not black, it's basically, it's like a holy, it's like a mesh type thing. And then you've got the full on black sticker. So you get a sticker pack of four there, a little setup. So we're gonna go ahead and draw for those. Uh, all you gotta do is comment down in the comment section. And when I'm done ringing the anvil, we can go to the main camp. When I'm done ringing the anvil, Jessica will pick one name at random for all of those that you knew here. But before we do that, how many people we got in the stream, Jess? It looks like we are at 170. Woohoo, 170 people. Well, thank you all for being here. Glad you, glad you joined us. Glad you joined us. So how many likes? Um, okay. Bunches. Uh, 96. 96? Yeah. And 170? Uh-huh. What a bunch of freeloaders here. That's what it is. Uh -huh. A bunch of freeloaders who don't like this sort of thing. Not, not sharing their thumbs. No, they're not sharing your thumbs. All right, well, I'll get them in other ways. I will get them in other ways. All right, we ready, Jess? Yeah. Let's, all right, ready, set, go. <laughs> who we got? Uh, all right, Sally um, Creek Forge, who needs more stickers for his toolbox? Hey, Sally Creek Forge. Creek Forge, congratulations, brother. Get with us through the contact link in the description down below, and we will get these shipped out to you. Got to give us your address and all that good stuff. We ready? Yep. Let's go. <laughs> Who else we got? All right, we landed on Ouroboros Armory, who says stickers. Ouroboros? Hey, congratulations. She only needs a year of the anvil. Get with us, Ouroboros, and we will ship you out whichever stickers you'd like. So just get, get with us there in the contact link down in the description. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for being here. We ready? Let's do one more. Okay. Who do we got? <laughs> well, Brett Larson, he says, I'm, I, I've seen his name before I read the comment, but he says, I'm commenting to comment since I already got a sticker pack, but here's my comment. <laughs> Does that mean we should draw someone else? Yeah, let's draw someone else. <laughs> All right, uh, man, easy one, two, three, lucky number sticker. Woohoo! Lucky number sticker. Man easy, congratulations. <laughs> Some of y'all screen names are funny to say. <laughs> Some of them are funny. Some of them are slightly inappropriate, <laughs> so I can't even, <laughs> so they're, hard to, they're hard to say, <laughs> put out on, on camera, but yeah, thank you for being here, man easy. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not being insulting. If I am, I don't really care, but <laughs> you want some free stickers, get with us in the contact section down below. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on, shall we? Let's keep this ball rolling. How many hours we've been at? Um, uh, just a little over an hour. An hour and ten minutes. Sweet! Milking that YouTube watch time. Doing it perfectly. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we need to rivet this together, and then we will draw a name for these. Of course, I'm going to have a little bit of cleanup work to do on these tongs. Uh, we can go to camera number two, Jess or anvil cam. I'm gonna have a little bit of cleanup work to do on these tongs after the stream is over and done so they won't look this hairy carry and nasty, but we're gonna get them all riveted together and everything and touch marked, and then I'll do all the little final cleanup work before I ship them out. So, but these will be all riveted together and cleaned up and ready for use when you get them. So I've made myself a little hearty stake that goes in the hearty hole of the anvil that has a rivet depression to support the round domed head on the rivet here. If everybody can see that okay. So we're just going to put that down in the anvil and we're going to start by keeping the jaws open like so and then we're going to peen, we're going to pin that together and that will keep that locked in tight so those two halves are together. The next step is we will get this whole thing hot this little rivet area here, and we will finish riveting this thing down and then adjusting the actual jaws themselves. We'll adjust the jaws and the reins right after that point uh, once we get that fully riveted down there. So I'll stick that back in the fire. 
Now you're going to need to watch when you're doing this that you don't burn up the tips of your jaws there because they're tapers. So you got to heat that boss area up real nice and slow like. You need to get that boss area really slowly heated where that rivet is. Um, so don't put it in there and have the air blast just blaring through. You know, you want to bring it up to maybe a dull orange in color. You don't want this to be a bright white or a yellow because you've already melted off the tips of your tongs. So just keep that in mind when you do this. I'm also going to be using a coal mop or a coal swab. I'm going to be setting it on the handles of the tongs to keep them cool while it's in the forge. That way I can handle the tongs in hand with this hand and then work on the jaws and I don't have to grab another pair of tongs and use those. Not a big deal when you have long handled tongs, but on little short handled tongs, you definitely need to put a little bit of water or put a wet rag on the handles so this way the heat doesn't transfer back up. So hopefully we're on the main cam. Yes, we are. Good. Otherwise, I was just talking to airspace for no reason. So. All right, questions, comments, super chats. Sure. Um, let's see here. Brute Lemon, <laughs> $10 super chat, says just changing the color. Well, thank you. Thank you. If anybody disagrees with the color, oh, very good. It just changed again. It's a yellow. He changed it to yellow. Yeah. Oh, he changed it to yellow. Okay. Well, if anybody doesn't like yellow, feel free to change it. That doesn't bug me at all. The color changes to, you know, a nice purple in color. We could go for that. Purple? Yeah, it's like it's like hundred dollar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, magenta. No. Anybody wants to do magenta? No, no tankers. Okay, it was Roy's favorite color. Least on YouTube. <laughs> Actually, green's my favorite color. Just FYI, that's a bunch of useless information you never need to know about a blacksmith. His favorite color. Brett Larson says you should call camera number two Olga Cam. Yeah, we should. Olga Cam. Well, I guess I should have thought about that before I named my anvil Olga, huh? Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> It went blue. Yeah, Yamas changed it. Woohoo! Thank you, Yamas. Appreciate that, brother. Any comments with that? Uh, no. Just changing colors. Just changing it. Yep. That's just how you all roll. So, everybody give anyone who's super chat a big round of applause down in the comments section down below. Um, all the money that comes in from those super chats really do help us to be able to ship out these items. Sometimes when we ship them around the world or we get international people who win the tongs, it's 40 bucks per tong, 40, 50 bucks per tong to ship it out, out, out of country as where, you know, um, so that just really helps out as where, you know, something like, uh, you know, if it's in the States, it might still be 10, 15 bucks to ship a pair of tongs. Uh, so we greatly appreciate that and those that support us on a regular basis. And those of you who do support us, even if it's your first time I'm here, and this is the first time you've seen that sort of thing, we like to honor those who support us by putting you in that pre-roll before the stream gets started and put your name up there in lights. Just another way of saying thank you um, for supporting what we do on the stream and just constantly making this um, the best stream on the internet. Best stream on the internet. Just keep checking these because I don't want anything to burn up. So, I have a question from Scott Brown who says, Should I get a leather apron to protect against flying chips? Against flying what? Flying chips. Uh, yeah, if, if you feel like you need a leather apron, there's some smiths who don't like to wear leather aprons. Um, I personally like them, they keep the front end of my drawers clean. Uh, you know, and I'm always, I have a habit. I don't know, it just happened from when I was working in heating and air conditioning. As you get your hands dirty on something, you just wipe like that on them old Sintas pants, you know, work pants. People who are here in America, they probably under, they, they know what I'm talking about. Anybody who works construction, the good old fashioned Sintas pants that the company pays for to have replaced. Uh, you know, you just like, oh, I got a, oh man, I got a, you know, bit of silicone on my hands. Wipe 
you know. And instead of, it was a bad habit to get started. I was notorious for it as well. It was horrible. Then I started carrying shop rags to wipe my hands on instead. That worked out a lot better. Made the boss a lot happier. Um, but uh, yeah, that carried over when I started doing blacksmithing. So I just have black pants. You know, I've got certain pants that are just like, they look like they're grease soaked down the front. Um, so yeah, so if you like to keep your pants clean, <laughs> An apron can be really nice. It can also be a fashion statement. A fashion statement. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, it does a lot of different reasons. This here has got a heavy, this is a buffalo hide apron. So it's got buffalo hide on it, like water buffalo. And then it's got a heavy grain, like nine ounce. I think it's nine ounce. I'm not sure. Um, like raw hide, like, like a cow hide on here, top grain stuff, it's full stuff, and it protects my gut. So when I'm at the power hammer, a lot of times you're holding your tongs and you might get in front of them, and if they were to ever kick back, they would have something to hit on and not go right through me. So, and if you're asking yourself, man, he's made, he's made a lot of excuses to himself, you're exactly right. I made a lot of justifications of why I needed a nice pair <laughs> of a leather apron. Oh. But yeah, I, I support getting leather aprons. It doesn't hurt. Brett Larson says that he has one, but it's been too hot to wear it so far. Uh, yeah, that's kind of why Roy switched from the full out apron to the half apron. Yep. Yeah, I, I've got a full apron, um, and that's getting too hot for me to even hold by hand. So I'm gonna just get a pair of tongs and grab my tongs. <laughs> And these are ready to go. I've got a full apron and I will wear that in the winter months, but I like the, I like this newer apron better because it's definitely more breathable. So let's go to the anvil, Jess. Got it nice and hot. Gonna pull down this rivet. Gonna adjust the tongs in line. It's all about getting those jaws in line. Then you wanna get your reins aligned up. As long as you got that good to go, then we should be able to knock these things open. I'll brush this off real quick. And I'll be able to start working these, these jaws open right after I put on my touch mark. Don't want to forget that, huh? They always remind you. Yeah. Got the touch mark on there. I'll grab the, I'm gonna go quench off the handles real quick. Not a chance, not a chance. All right, so now while this cools down, I'm gonna work it back and forth like this, just like you've seen people do. And you quench this off and quench this off in water. I usually, when I'm not doing a live stream, I will quench these in oil and work them like this as I do that. And it helps develop to like a seasoned finish on them. <laughs> it's really important that you don't drive this rivet home too tight when you're making these because metal expands when it's hot and it contracts when it gets cold. So this joint will tighten up as it cools down. So it's important not to drive it too tight. Now once it's, once it's cooled down fully and then you say, okay, it's got a little bit too much slop in the tong jaws themselves, you can always just give it a couple quick little pops on the anvil and that'll snug everything up on that riveted joint. There we go, those are done. What's everybody think about those? They like them. Not too bad? They're working on their phrases already. Yeah. <laughs> they want to make sure they're involved, eh? Yeah, they're getting, the 
getting the thumbs warmed up. All right. So I will go ahead. I guess we could probably draw for them, huh? We'll go main cam. All right, so this is for these, for the scrolling tongs. We're about to shift over and make the regular pair of tongs, like flat jaw tongs. So we'll be making those here next. So we'll be doing that. And then also, for those of you who don't win tongs, we will also be giving away a pair of kit tongs. So we will be giving away additional tongs as well. A pair of bolt jaws and a pair of slot jaws a little later on in the stream. So if you don't win, these two pair, we're giving away four pairs total of tongs, so it's worth sticking around. Worth sticking around, so. All right, are we ready? Are their fingers wearing out? Shall I walk off screen and go take a smoke break? Which is funny because I don't smoke, so that could be a long while. <laughs> How's the chat rate, Jess? <laughs> is it zooming? It's a zoom in, huh? It's not computing. Good. That's the way we like it. We like it to not be computing. So. <laughs> awesome. Good. They're right in time. Right in time. We just got to give away all the other items before everybody shows up at the very end of the stream, like they've been doing. We got to make sure we give away everything before the end of the stream, long before the end of the stream. Right? Yeah, because that's what we said we were going to do, huh? So we better honor that, eh? Yeah. 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 So All right. Okay, I better draw. <laughs> They're going to get angry. Ready? Are you all ready? Let's do it. Who do we got? We have Dragonstone Jim and Ironworks Crawford. Roy, tongs for me, please. Hey, hey, Mr. Crawford, you won one, brother. Congratulations. Congratulations. You know what to do. Get with us. Contact link. Send us your address, my friend, and we will send you a pair of scrolling tongs. Right on. Right on. Love when that works out. Those of you who don't know, Mr. Crawford has been a part of the channel for a very long time and he is an avid supporter of ours and can't thank you enough for taking time out, brother, for being here. Appreciate it. You finally won you, won, won you something. <laughs> we'll send those out to you promptly. Congratulations. Everybody give him a hand clap as we start on our next debacle. All right. Get rid of that. Go to the anvil cam. So now, we're going to make these. These are a simple twist tong, flat jaw tong. Again, from Ken's Custom Iron that we got these from. Provided to us by Couch Forge Company. So thank you very much, Couch Forge Company, for sending us all these tongs that we can give away and do that. That is a huge blessing to the channel and it's a huge blessing to the community. So everybody give them a hand clap. Um, definitely give them a hand clap down in the comment section down below. So, all right, so we're going to heat these up and we're going to twist them. Going to get on it. Questions? Yes, there was one. <laughs> There's one earlier on uh, how much fuel you use on a weekly basis. Good question. Um, when I'm forging, when I have weeks where I'm doing mostly forging, I can go through several hundred pounds of coke. So two, three hundred pounds of coke in a week. Um, and that's because that is kind of, that's full out, that's full out forging, basically. Going, going full out for nine, ten hour days or whatever, whatever the jobs require. But that's offset it by the time that I'm not forging full out because I'm busy finishing, doing a lot of finishing work for things or prep work for welding or whatever. Um, so I would say probably in an average month, I might go through 200 pounds of coke, maybe 250 pounds of coke is what I go through in fuel. It'll also depend if I'm using the gas forge as well. If I'm using the gas forge, that offsets that. I go through about a 100 pound cylinder once a month when I'm using the gas forge predominantly. So, and that's at forging temps, I should make should make note of that. 
that's at forging temperatures. That's not at welding temps in, say, a gas forge. So that does make a difference on the fuel bill. That uh, last pair of scrolling tongs you made there, did you go into uses for scrolling tongs at all? Say what? Have you gone into any uh, purposes or uses that scrolling tongs might normally be used in? Oh, they're handy for everything. Um, I use them all the time as like a pair of needle nose pliers. They're just as handy as a pair of needle nose pliers. You can use them for just about anything. Um, I like using them mostly to tweak scrolls, but also like ram's horns, or if I need to just grip a hold of something and twist it, they just have a nice profile to get into little areas and give little tweaks to stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I use them all the time for all sorts of purposes, not just scrolling up scrolls. So usually scrolling tongs, scrolling tongs are meant to be kind of like a fine, fine grade tool. They're not meant to like, oh, I've got a piece of bar stock, now I'm gonna go ahead and just scroll it up by hand, right? That's, they're meant to tweak things that have already been scrolled up. Or like, for instance, flower petals on a rose. I'll use scrolling tongs with a torch and, and use a lot of scrolling tongs for that sort of work. Very super handy. Uh, again, horns on the ram, on like a ram's head. Uh, very handy for that purpose as well. All right, so that's good and hot. So now I need to find two pairs of tongs that I want to use. They don't have to be anything special. They just have to fit the bar stock to do the twist. We can go to the anvil there, Jess. So I'm just using two flat jaw type tongs, okay? And again, if you have a vise, you don't have to do it this way. But I'm going to clamp the boss in one pair of tongs, like you see. And then I'm gonna use the other pair of tongs to grip the jaw, and then I'm just gonna use it as a lever, and I'm gonna twist it. Just like you see, like that. Hopefully that makes sense. And you can check it for square. If it's not square, you can twist it back or do whatever you gotta do. And now that is ready to be cleaned up. Now we got that done, we'll hammer out the twist. And again, be cautious to not do too much right there on that eye. We want that to still fit our rivet. So there you go, there's one jaw half twisting. As you can see, you don't need a vise. You don't need a vise. You can just use a pair of tongs to twist. We'll set that aside and we'll put in our another piece and get it hot. A couple of questions more about um, fuels. Yeah, uh, one of them is why do you prefer Coke to propane from C. Struble? Great question, Mr. C. Struble. I prefer Coke because it's an intense heat and it's closest thing to what I started blacksmithing in, which was green coal. I, I use green coal for many, many years. Here, we don't have the proper setup for doing green coal. Um, so I'm using Coke instead for that. Plus it's cleaner. I like the Coke and, and the smell of the thing. The other benefit is, as you can tell, you can hear me talking right now. If that gas forge was running that's over here off to my right, you would not be able to hear me talking to you. It would be almost deafening because it's a forced air. It's a forced, um, it's a mechanically aspirated gas forge. So it's got forced air through it. Um, that mixes with the gas and ignites, uh, very similar to like a ribbon burner. It's not a ribbon burner forge, but I'm just saying that so you guys understand the principle because you're more or less likely to understand what a ribbon burner is. Um, but yeah, so, so that's loud. That's great for production if you're going to put a bunch of pieces in and I can't give the pieces my utmost attention. I like using the gas forge for that. I like using the Coke forge because it gets so much hotter. The gas forge over here um, to my right, it will get, it will get up to about 
tw about 2100 degrees, about there. It, it, it'll get about there as where the Coke can get to nearly 3000 degrees. It's like 2900 degrees. So it's a lot more localized intense heat and I could get a lot more work done for just what I do. So that's why I prefer the Coke. Um, it's really not one's better than the other. It's just the one I use is the most efficient for the work that I'm doing for the day. Um, I don't prefer, uh, my preference is to stick with traditional kind of fuels. But again, it's whatever the day calls for. Um, recently I had to straighten out a 20 inch diameter scroll for the scroll jig that I made and I would have been there all day trying to get it hot over the coke forge, building up a bed, getting it spread out wide enough to lay that in there. When all I had to do, boom, remove a few fire bricks, throw it in the gas forge that's open on three sides and just bring it up to heat within 25 minutes and I'm good to go. And I was able to tweak and straighten it and do those things like that. So in that case, the gas forge was more handy for me. So that's the one that I use. It's very important, I'll just say this. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very important for beginners to understand beginners or uh, you know people have even been doing it for maybe a year or two or something like that to understand that when you're getting into this craft do not be bum foozled by this tool is best that tool is best or no that tool's great that tool's garbage people will have preferences different smiths will have different preferences there's people who have giant power hammers in their shop and they would never think about owning a press that, that they just couldn't care for them they're too slow, they're like whatever, right? They, they have a preference, they're, they're more preferenced towards, uh, you know, power hammer, a giant power hammer, because they got a 1500 pound, you know, Chambersburg sitting in their, in, in their shop. So why would they care about a press, right? But then you've got the guy that's in his garage, right? And he can't be, and he's in the middle of a cul-de-sac and he can't be having the noise that's associated with a 1500 pound, boom right and your neighbor's coffee jumps on his coffee table right as like he can't do that right so so there's a preference so it'll work better he'll be like no presses they're the best they're quiet they're this they're efficient they're whatever both are true both are true you can get power hammer you can get press you can get coal you can get gas you can get uh, induction um, it's whichever most benefits you in your particular forging situation and your setup, that's what's going to be best at that point in time. So as long as you keep that in mind when you're out there tool buying, uh, you really can't go astray. So let's go back to the anvil, Jess. Great question. I'm hoping I'm grabbing this the same. I think I am. I think, I think, I think I am. Grab that again. Right, nice, nice. toy like. Up we go. Again, we're twisting these both the same direction, just like in any other tong work that you would see somebody do. And then we're gonna hammer out the twists that are associated with it. Again. Trying to stay off that one edge. There, got that straightened up where I wanted it. Good. And again, we'll adjust these once we put the rivet in them. That brushed up, looking good. Everybody can see that okay, look good? Uh, yeah. All right, grab this other pair of tongs and we'll compare them. Again, they both go to the left. One will flip over and go on top of the other and poof, voila. They go together just like so. No, nope, no edges need to be relieved unless you want them relieved. You can, um, I would suggest doing it with a belt sander or something like that if you want to relieve an edge. 
Uh, forging in it with a twist tong like this is kind of tedious to relieve any edges. Um, they're basically already from the manufacturer set up to have all the spacing and gaps and the stuff that you need in order for the tong to work out okay. So you don't need to do a whole lot there. All right, set those down and let them cool off a naturale for a moment. And while those cool down naturally, we'll give away some more stickers. Hey. And I got Cut. a question real quick I was gonna ask you from Ben Toombs, um, and that was, how much does it cost to fill your propane tank there? I have one of the same size. It cost him about $60 where he's at. Same. That's, it, it ranges anywhere from about 60 bucks to about 75 per tank to get filled for 100 pounds. Great question, Ben. Good to have you, buddy. Good to have you here. All right, we ready? We're gonna give away another sticker bundle. We'll go to camera number two. Just to show off it, we got camera number two. And how many people would like to see a third and fourth camera angle? Just comment down in the comment section. Would you like to see that someday? Soon. Good. We'll give them the time to uh, get their comments ready. Strong's Adventures, thank you for the super chat. Says, haven't gotten to watch one of your live streams in a while and just wanted to change the color of the sign. Awesome. Thank you very much, brother, for the super chat. Greatly appreciate it. Every little bit does help. We do appreciate that. And as you can tell, we're going to have a lot in shipping, aren't we? We have a ton in shipping. <laughs> oh, all right. We ready? Let's draw some names. Ready? One, two, three. Who do we got? All right. We have uh, Eddie Smith, who says more stickers. More stickers. Eddie Smith, congratulations. Get with us in the contact link down below. Greatly appreciate it. Let's do contestant number two. Who do we got? Our next winner is Thomas Matthews, who says stickers, please. Thomas Matthews, you're very welcome for some stickers. Thank you for being here. Thank you for using your manners, please. All right, ready? Let's do another one. Who do we got? We have Ty Viner who says, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Well, you can uncross those fingers. Don't have to be so dainty and ladylike. <laughs> You've got some stickers now. You can let it all hang out. <laughs> hey, dial it back. Dial it back, young man or lady, or whoever, just dial it back. <laughs> I'm seeing several people. It's kind of hard to see the comments for the cameras because they kind of got mixed in. Debaca Maker says, LOL, four cameras. Amazing for more stickers. Uh, <laughs> so the camera comments kind of got mixed in. Yeah. yeah. Cameras, huh, for four cameras, eh? They're like three, yeah. meh. They're kind of like, yeah, they're all right. <laughs> well, if they're just meh, okay, then I won't spend the money on them to get them into the shop. <laughs> Ernie Beeswick says camera three can be for Roy Rance. There you go. There's a guy I watch on YouTube. Well, more or less listen to. He does uh, Joe Scott from, um, he does a thing it's like with answers with Joe or something. A lot, a lot of like space type stuff, science type stuff. Anyways, I find him interesting. Anyways, he has a thing where he does a tangent cam. So he'll look and it's kind of like his rant cam, you know, where he's going off on a bunny trail. So he just looks at the tangent cam and it says like tangent cam, you know, and it, it's kind of like flashing and whatever. It, it, it's, a, it's a funny little take on that. I'm like, I need me a tangent cam. That's what I need. Yeah, it'll be the rant cam. There you go. Like it comes in really close on your face, you know. Punches in, you know. And it is. It's like zoomed in. It's like more personal. It's, it's a lot more personal to his face. So I don't know if you guys really want me to get that close and personal with you. But we're all cool. He's off. It, it would make your Roy Rance even more serious. It would, wouldn't it? You could like green screen and like the background could be like lightning bolts or something. 
Yeah, so, so for those of you that are interested in us having multiple camera angles, those people that are super chatting and supporting the stream, whatever doesn't go to buying anvils and chipping and stuff like that is all going aside for better and better hardware so we can do better and better streaming. What I really would like to do one day in the stream is I would like to have a total of four cameras. And I would like to have a camera over at the workbench so this way I can draw out a big drawing and that would be an overview shot so we can actually take scroll elements or gate elements or chair elements or whatever and I can talk so it's an easy smooth transition over to that and I don't have something that's like out of focus where you can't see or it's like way back away um, in the backdrop here and then I would like to add an additional camera down at the anvil so I could give you a different opposing viewpoint at the anvil cam that Jessica can switch back and forth so I can have more free range of movement with the anvil. Because right now, I'm fine as long as I'm up here towards the horn. You go to the camera number two. Okay. Like, I'm fine as long as I'm like within this space. You can see okay, right? But if I'm back here and I need to adjust something clear out here on the tail, it's a lot less apparent. So I would like to be able to have a camera that's coming from this direction, so this way you can see no matter where I'm at on the anvil. Or if we go, if you look down here, I've got an upset block. Sometimes that's not apparent. I don't upset things where I would use them on the upset block normally because it's out of shot. It's out of focus, right? Depending on how I have that. So we can go back to camera number one, main cam. So like you may not be able to see, I might need to be upsetting a bar, you know, upsetting a bar stock on the upset block and it might be nice to not only be able to see me here but have like a split screen where not only do you see me here but you also see the bar being upset down on the upset block so I can set that up in advance and that would be that would be more primo so eventually we will get to that point so anyways I guess that's my roundabout way of just saying thank you to everyone who supports these streams they they do matter it does matter and it does help and we do greatly appreciate you all for doing so. Without further ado, let's get these in the fire and we will round off the handles. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> definitely some suggestions where you could put all the different cameras, um, <laughs> like an overhead shot. Uh, Gordon Farmer says maybe a forge cam. Yep. Like for forge welding, for instance, if I was gonna do forge welding, it would be great to be able to have a cam that is set up right at the forge and adjusted because you have to adjust the camera that it can actually see into the forge to see the stuff that you're doing and, and watch the metal come up to welding heat. So you say, okay, this is coming up to welding heat now. Now you can see the surface starting to run. Now you can do this and you can actually see it in the forge and it's all set up and that's what that cam's there for. So you can see the welding heat come up to heat and then you've got the other camera and you can see it going well as well so and we're gonna have to do a battery swap because that's almost dead Jess so I can go grab another battery unless you've got one I'll, I'll go grab it you talk to people I'll grab it real quick I shall talk to people's <laughs> Sphere Grass Forge Roy's going to end up with 20 cameras spread around the shop haha -ha. Um, actually, we're thinking about getting a little camera switcher, uh, which actually only has four inputs into it. So that would be probably our limit for a while, and probably four is more than enough to uh, meet our needs of us, our setup here. Roy's working in a limited space. It's not like a big concert or something where it can be handy to have um, a dozen different camera shots. So, yep. <laughs> Yeah, a drone would be a little tricky with the beams in the shop and uh, yeah, <laughs> probably freak out Roy while he's forging, like flying way too close to him. Hmm. 
GoPro on the camera. That would be, yeah, that would definitely give you a headache trying to watch that footage. <laughs> Call it a hammer pro. Yeah, Ben. A weather cam on top of the shop. Yeah, that could be interesting too. All right, we got that battery changed. All right. See how it's doing now. Let me get it refocused. Skull Forge. <laughs> Would you let Roy forge in a kilt? Haha. -ha. Roy has not wanted to forge in a kilt, so it's not likely he will. <laughs> yep. Chris. Do you, do you have the camera feedback? Um, let me check. Yes, we have camera feedback and it looks in focus. Okay, okay good. Good. Yep, I would never forge in a kilt. Not interesting. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say never because you know what happens to people who say never. They end up eating their words so someday. All right. Time for me to round these handles off. Go the anvil. I'm not gonna do a ton of rounding here. This is literally just to take the sharp corner, corners off. Anybody who wants to make them more round, you can probably break out the belt sander or something on them when you get them. But this is just more or less to break the corner edges on them. Make sure we're good to go here. Good, nice and straight. Good. There's one rounded up. Set that aside. We will round the next one up. What do we got, Jess? Um, <laughs> just just a few reminders here. Ouroboros Armory said there was a hundred dollar super chat for Roy and a kilt. <laughs> yes, but he didn't agree. <laughs> was that just this stream? No, a different Well, we can't live in the past now, can we? <laughs> <laughs> How many hundred dollar super chats would it take to let the hombres swing free? <laughs> Strong's Adventure says Roy was never going to make metal flip flops, but he did. Was never going to do what? It's going to make metal flip flops. You did make them. I did. Yeah. I did make metal flip flops. So there we go. Those are all nice and rounded up. Good. On the end, anyhow. All right. Cool those off. The handle ends, anyhow. Now we'll get set up for our rivet. Root Lemon says you could do a live stream forging on that Blackstone. <laughs> live stream forging on the Blackstone? <laughs> All right, here we go. Flip them over themselves. Put the rivet through. Hopefully I didn't deform it too bad. There we go. Beautiful. Leave it open a little bit. And get that initial set done. Everybody can see that okay. Good? 
All right. Rob Huff says, if we get Roy back to Goshen on a 90 degree day, he might reconsider. Hey, 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 hey. I'm gonna start reconsidering my map dot on 90 degree days and stay here in the north where I'm comfortable. Where I'm more comfortable, more good or better. More good or better. Be I'm feeling spicy. Feeling spicy. Feeling spicy. Feel inspired. I'm gonna give away a pair of these bolt jaws. Yep. These aren't made, so you'll have to make them. Put a little sweat equity in it. I know, life's a drag, but we all gotta work someday, right? So <laughs> I'm gonna give away a pair of these bolt jaw tongs, and uh, all you have to do is comment a phrase down in the comment section down below. So, and we will ship them out anywhere to you in the world that you are. Yeah, for the bolt job. And have I been missing any super chats or am I okay? We're good? All right. Well, definitely shout them out if you know them. So I can't see. Again, the screen's too small. It's a bit behind my face. And it's, and it's kind of it's weird. It, it's a bit, I don't know, it's a bit schmuckish to constantly be like, like, so, did anybody super chat? You, why haven't you super chatted? Why is, that, why is that sign still the same color as the last time I looked at it five minutes ago? You know, <laughs> I'm trying not to do that. It's like, it's curious. I can't see it in the screen. So I got all these lights blinding me. I'm hoping that I'm acknowledging people when they do super chat. That's my, that's my thing, but just checking to see how much money I'm making there. <laughs> ben Toom says, if I just didn't drop a thousand on a telescope, you would be in trouble, LOL. You didn't have to do that to see me, Ben. You could have saved yourself a thousand bucks. <laughs> and my blinds are officially closed now for the rest of the year. <laughs> now that we know Ben Toombs has a telescope. <laughs> Just gonna get better. Thank you for the two dollars yeah. super chat. He says he's here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. There it is. It changed. <laughs> oh, all right, we ready? Everyone super. Everyone commenting amongst themselves. Full phrases. Yep. Let's draw for them. Ready? Set. Go. <laughs> Who do we got? We have four ten forge blacksmith who says, "Let me get." those tong, ta tong, tongs. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I just heard Cisco in my head. That is bad. <laughs> Congratulations. 410, is it 410 Forge? Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. You got that tong to tong, tong, tong. So <laughs> all you gotta do is hit us up in the contact down below. You know what to do. And those will be for you. Those are the bolt jaw tongs. I like that. You know what to do and those will be for you. And those are, yeah. Man, all sorts of rhymes are going. You know, I also feel extra special. Let's give away a pair of slot jaw tongs. Can they see that? Can they see that? Yeah. Can they see that? If I move around real fast, are they still able to see it? <laughs> we're gonna give away a pair of these slot jaw tongs. These are pretty cool tong um, for doing uh, flat, I guess flat par stock kniffs work. I don't know. Um, I haven't really used slot jaw tongs. I do believe that Black Bear Forge had done a video where he had made some of these and he actually forged his own. So I think he's used, used them quite extensively before uh, for different purposes. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I, I remember seeing a video of him doing those. Uh, of course, I made a how to put these together things when I had, when RX Tongs sent me some tongs very similar to these that had um, those, and I, I showed a how to put them together sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so pretty good. I think that, I think I did those. I might be wrong, so don't quote me. <laughs> might, might be wrong, but you don't care about any of that now, do you? No, nope, you're just sitting there waiting, waiting patiently. 
your little your, your little stumpy little fingers are starting to get shorter while they're pounding away on your computer screen. Wearing away the calluses. Wearing away the calluses. One little hurried up finger beat at a time. How long can I drag this out? Brother needs some watch time. <laughs> We're coming up on two hours. Good. Then we're going to finish. Huh? And exactly 40 seconds. All right. Well, it just got, I just, we don't want to, we don't want to get there too quick. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. Ready? Set. Go. Who do we got? We have um, Chris Schaefer. Slot me spicy tongs on a hot day. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Chris Shaver. You won the slot jaw tongs there, sir. Get with us. Contact link. Do your thing. We will send these to you. Your address. Very special. Very special. I'm one of those kind of guys. I'm that brother you wish you never had. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I told a guy at work that once. I said, this company is the family I never wanted and you're the, like the brother I never, wa I, I never had. <laughs> Thank you. It's worth the same. <laughs> what were you going to say, Jess? Oh, I was going to say, also, Brute Lemon, thank you for the super sticker of the exercise pair. The exercise pair. The exercising pair. Yeah, I got, got his headband. Maybe I should just start wearing a headband. Shop. Yeah. Like, break it out like 1970s, 1980s. Headbands between 70s and 80s. I think those were popular. The sweat band. And like the neon covered uh, wife beater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, now we're thinking. Now we're thinking. Fro. <laughs> oh gosh. I already got a white fro right now. This hair. It's at that annoying stage where it's not long enough that you can style it, but it's not short enough that it's that you know you don't have to comb it or do something with it. So it's just like puff. Look like a Q-tip. I am getting my beard ready for winter, though. Starting to grow it out now. I'm not blessed like some of you woolly beasts out there that can just like blah if they don't shave in a week, you know. So I got to start working on mine six months ahead if I'm going to have a nice woolly beard. For winter. I probably won't get real long. I'll, I keep it fairly short, but but summer is almost over for us up here in northern Michigan. Almost. We're supposed to have some 80 degree temperatures this weekend, and it very well may be the last 80 degrees of the year for us. It will be the last 80 degree temperatures of the year for us, so it's only getting colder from here on out. Because if you look in the evenings, it's like 50s. Might be 80 during the day, but it's 50 at night. So I don't believe the, the forecast for 80 during the day. It's gonna be 50 at night, so. Brute Lemon says, at least you got hair. I am as bald as a Walmart floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a new comment every day for everyone, isn't there? <laughs> Oh man, this is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to work on camera for y'all. Um, it, it is. It, it's a pleasure to do this. It's been uh, been the bright part of my day to be able to give stuff away. So thank you. I am a selfish person. I like giving things away, and you all allow me to do that. And my longtime subscribers and supporters, channel supporters, they allow me to do that and uh, keep helping me to be able to do that with all their support and their generous donations and stuff. And uh, what can I say? Feel very blessed to have you all around. So thank you for being here. And if this is your first time joining us, I don't know. It might be. 
If this is your first time joining us and you like what you see here, you most likely like the rest of the 1450 some odd videos that are on here on YouTube on the channel. So I encourage you to subscribe. So this way you know when we go live and you'll get the notifications. Now you have to subscribe and hit that bell and set it for all notifications. Otherwise, YouTube won't notify you until like two or three days later, basically. So, but that's up to you. <laughs> so again, just thank you everyone who's, who's here and supports and allows us to do that. I, I like giving stuff away. Again, we had a subscriber give us those, Couch Forge Company. He gave us a bunch of tongs so we could give them away. And then we got people who support us with the Super Chat so this way we can afford to be able to give them away. And it really is a community effort. So I invite you, if you are brand new here to the channel, that you subscribe and, and become a part of this community. Or if you're one of them closet warriors out there, one of them closet viewers that watch but never speak, I encourage you to speak a little bit. Get with the community on here. We're not, we're not all bad, and we don't bite that hard. We just nibble a bit. All right. <laughs> we had a orange super chat, chat from 410 Forge Blacksmith. It says Roy singing Cisco, totally worth 20 bucks. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh. That's a tell on age, ain't it, too? It's starting to be. It used to be the hip thing. Now it's like, now it's the oldies. <laughs> That's like the new form of the oldies. It's bad. Jim Okers asks if you enjoy teaching smithing to teenagers. I enjoy teaching smithing to just about anyone. So whether it be teenagers, young people, um, or even all the way up to past their prime people, right? Like I just, I enjoy teaching in general. Um, the real big thing that, that gets me to either like a student or dislike a student is level of attention. That's it. If, if they're there and they're attentive to what I'm talking about and, and they're doing what I'm telling them to do, then they're not wasting my time. They've got the respect level. It works great. That's good no matter what age. Um, it, worst, worst thing you can do with me is show disrespect. As soon as that happens, out the door you go. <laughs> oh, most teenagers I've, I've come across, they're pretty good, pretty good at doing that. There's a few that, are, you know, no, they're not there for <laughs> wanting to actually learn. All right. Drive this down, round that rivet off. I'm gonna get that straightened up. Now I'm gonna leave these plain one, because I'm lazy, but two, I want you to be able to set these jaws up for any way that you see fit when you get it to your own shop. That way it'll be most handy to you. It does not benefit you to have tongs that I decide what their final dimension and shape is going to be. You can just heat the end up and shape it to whatever, whatever you so desire your tongs to be. That's what's great about these tongs, is you can really just make just about anything out of them. Make anything from them, I should say. Jaw got a little crooked on me. You do that to the other one as well. Straighten it. Mm, there we go. All right. So like I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell the tongs what they're gonna be. That's gonna be your job when you get them to adjust them exactly to what you want them to fit. What size stop? Go. Gotta get these reins, Justin. 
Gordon Farmer wants to know if he can grind off uh, grind tongs to grip the metal more, and if you have to round the tongs out. Grind the tongs. So like put grooves in them. Um, generally that's kind of looked down upon. You can do that, and to, but keep in mind that if you if you grind grooves, a bunch of grooves into the tong jaws, that might transfer itself onto your work. If you bite hard and the tong wiggles around, it might actually leave those little grooves or uh, little bite marks on the, um, the piece that you're working on. <coughs> so if you grind grooves, make sure they're smooth grooves. They're not like sharp things uh, that are kind of like, like pipe, like a pipe wrench. Don't have sharp teeth like in a pipe wrench. That's not what you want because it's just gonna mar up wherever you're holding the piece. It'll help with the grip, but about 90% of what the grip is in a pair of tongs, well, I gotta heat these back up and go back to the main cam. 90% of what the grip is in a pair of tongs, it is the length of the handle for leverage. So the longer, the handle length is, comparatively to how short the jaws are, gives you your clamping pressure. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have a, <coughs> if you have a really short jaw, like these tongs here, we can go to the camera number two. Can you see this? This thing needs to get rotated a little bit. Can you see that all right? Yeah. There you go. You can see I've got a really short jaw on it and really long reins. And these are specialty tongs for holding plate, uh, pieces of plate, like thin plate. But when I clamp down on this with just moderate pressure, those suckers hold so tight. <coughs> I can hit something on the edge like this and not pop it out of the jaws. Like this bites hard enough that it actually leaves a mark, an impression of these jaws in the steel. So it's, that's kind of what you're looking for. You, you want, if you need more biting pressure on the jaw ends, you need to be able to add longer length handles and be able to compress those to give you more leverage to get a tighter bite. Versus cutting a bunch of sharp edges in on here and having that mar your work. Hopefully that makes sense. And if it doesn't, when I say hopefully that makes sense, that is me making sure that you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So sometimes I need to express it five different ways for you to actually get it once, right? Um, sometimes I have to have a blacksmith to say it five different ways before I'm like, I get what he's saying now, just because what I think he should be saying doesn't click with what lines up with my brain. So hopefully that comes out. So we'll go ahead and put this touch mark into this piece. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And this, and this, a muy bueno, muy bueno. And we'll tighten that joint up just a smudging. There we go, work that out. Alice Harvey has, says, how many pairs of tongs did it take you to get them assembled perfectly? These? I don't know, probably 10, 20 of them. And there's still things I'm learning about tongs. So a lot of, a lot of my tongs I'm making now are not like your basic shape type tongs. They're just stuff I need for in the moment. And I'm still learning things about making tongs because, you know, you think you got the p process down pat and it throws you through a loop. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, I got this figured out and you don't. <laughs> so it, you will find, you'll find that that will be true throughout everything. And then you screw up stuff or you draw one handle out too long or a jaw ends up, you beat it a little thin. You thought you were doing, you got carried away. You know, you punch a hole off center and now you got a pair of tongs that don't function properly. Like there's all that type stuff that just happens 
you know, when you're in the process of making tongs. It's kind of just par for the course, really. You just uh, do the best you can um, with what you got. And really the only real way of getting really good with tongs, making tongs, is to, the best way is to make one style of tongs and get really good and adjust all your manufacturing process to make that one style of tongs. And then once you get really good at say, bolt jaw tongs, where you make those in your sleep, then start making scrolling tongs and you're gonna fail a lot because it's gonna present new challenges that maybe you didn't think about with the bolt jaw tongs or, you, or were not presented to you. And then you have to constantly work on those. But yeah, I'm still a work in progress when it comes to tongs. I'm no, by, by no means am I a professional tong maker, but I can knock together tongs fairly quick. I would say, and it kind of goes with my forging philosophy in my shop. Everything I'm doing is in support of the client's work, the customer's work. So my emphasis isn't on making the best darn looking, best tong that's gonna hold up for a zillion years out of the finest, rarest material known to man. Like that's not my eff that's not where I put my efforts. I put my efforts into the work that I'm getting done. And if I need to rip out a pair of tongs, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on tongs. It'll take me from start to finish 15, 20 minutes for a pair of tongs right now. That's in my current shop, 15, 20 minutes. So I can say, okay, you know what? I'm tired of this thing slipping out, falling on the floor. I'm gonna go make me a quick little 15 minute pair of tongs. That'll hold this a lot better. And I might use that thing once and then I end up giving them away some other time because I just don't ever use that size for whatever reason. And 10 years from now, I'll be able to make a tong a lot better, hopefully, than the first one I've ever made. So uh, again, I don't put a lot of uh, time into necessarily making the tools. It's all about making the product, getting that final product out the door. So that's been kind of the philosophy in my shop for a long time. Eventually, I would like to get to the point of being like Tom Latney, where every piece of, every piece of tooling in his shop is a work of art. So eventually, I'd like to do that, but Reality is that's not that's not where Roy's at right now in life. <laughs> Maybe when I retire from smithing full time someday. A hundred years from now. How many pairs of tongs would you estimate that you have? Well, I don't know. I could probably count them up here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Nope. Uh, three, Forty pair, maybe thirty or forty pair, and those get cycled. So they sit here now, and they might sit so long that I never use them, and then I I pitch them and I make new of something else that I want. So I'm always kind of going through them, just cycling. Some of them will break, you know. A um, little while ago, I showed how to make quarter by one flat stock tongs from quarter by one flat stock, and I had a whole bunch of comments of those will never last or those will never hold up. But it takes me 15 minutes to make them. They serve their duty for a year and then I can pitch them in the scrap bucket because I make enough money per job that I'm not concerned with the tongs or the tooling. Now, if I were to buy a pair of tongs from a guy and he charged me 60 bucks a pair of tongs, they better last me a hell of a lot longer than my 15 minute pair of tongs that I'm okay with throwing in the scrap pile. <laughs> after only six or eight months of use. So, big difference. I've got some tongs I've made out of quarter by one flat stock. These, three years, still, still working, going strong. These, two years, still going strong, wolf jaws. You know, bunch of other ones over there that I don't use as regular that have been around the same amount of time and they're still going strong. They haven't, haven't wore them out yet. So, so they work pretty good. All right. Enough of me yammering, stammering. Let's get on to other stuff. And somebody super chatted, I noticed. Um, the sign. Was, uh, I read that one already. That was for the Tom song. That was, that was for that one. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much again. <laughs> Just want to make sure I acknowledge it. All right. Are we ready to draw for these pair of tongs? We are. Which pair of tongs? 
This is going to be for the regular flat jaw tongs. Again, like I said, when you get them, you need to shape the jaws to whatever you want them to do. Uh, one possible shape, I did this the other day, the pair of tongs I made. Let me go to the anvil. I made this shape to hold hammer billets, hammer stock, or wider chunks. So you could do, you could do a pair, you could shape these, say, you just bend the nibs out and then bend them around something. Does that make sense? Yeah. You see that? So you can make a pair like this to hold stuff. Um, it doesn't just have to be bar stock tongs or just flat tongs. You can shape them really however you like. Um, yeah, just want to show those off. All right, we ready to draw? Yes, we are. Should I give them a heads up? We're up to the camera. You ready? Is there comments pouring in? Yeah, I don't know. They might be a little sleepy, so they're a little slower than earlier. They're a little tired? Yeah. A little sleepy? I mean, I guess we could just end the stream. If everyone's bored. Yeah. Well, I guess they've been making, for the last few minutes, they've been using all kinds of word, uh, word play on the word tongs. Oh. <laughs> so, Maybe they've been too busy thinking after the next one. So their perversion has wore them out then. <laughs> <laughs> now it's picking up. <laughs> now, now it's picking up because I've guilt tripped them into it. Eh? Oh. All right, let's go ahead and do this. So this is for the flat jaw tongs. Again, all you got to do is comment down below with a phrase, and uh, we will pick somebody at random. Ready, set, go. Who do we got? We have Brian Neely who says, those are the tongs I need. Brian Neely? Hey brother, congratulations. You've got those type of tongs that you need. <laughs> get with us, contact link. We'll ship them out to you once we get your address in. And uh, you go through all of those steps. So there we have it. Got a pair of scrollers done. Get, got a pair of flat jaw tongs done this evening. Gave away two other pairs of tongs, six sticker pendles. Yeah. 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 Can't ask for better than that, I wouldn't think. And all you had to do was warm up your easy chair <laughs> with your presence and sit there and watch. <laughs> yeah, get a bowl of popcorn going. So, again, I really do appreciate you all coming out. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button, all that other good stuff. Um, if you want to be notified when we do these in the future. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad to be able to be able to do this. Really am. Really glad. So next live stream, the next upcoming live stream, we'll be giving away our eighth, right? Be our eighth anvil. Be giving away anvil number eight in our year of the anvil. So we'll give it another one of them little 66 pound or 60 pound. Is it 60 or 66 pound? I think it's 66 pound. 66, yeah. yeah, it's a 66 pound Achayo anvil, a little dual horn there. Uh, we'll be giving another one of those away in not next week, but the following week's live stream. Um, so we do these live streams once every other week, basically. So twice a month usually. And then occasionally if if there's time or if I got the moment, I might do an AMA live stream where you, it's just more me sitting down and chatting. And uh, I greatly appreciate everybody who shows up to those as well uh, because it's usually a fun time. It's a great way of me interacting more directly with the comment section um, as well. So it's a great time, great time. So plenty of reasons to subscribe. Uh, just for those who sticking around, who want to know more about what to look forward to in the upcoming weeks. Upcoming weeks, I have a lot of videos coming out around fundamentals and forging practice, those type videos. So I hope you guys will give those a watch. I broke them down into like nice little like three to seven minute little things. So hopefully you guys can, you know, watch those on the fly or maybe go watch it in your shop real quick and then just go do it. That's kind of that's kind of the thought process behind those. Uh, so those are voiced over instructional videos uh, that I did. So this way, hopefully it's really clean and concise. 
and you guys can get through on those. Those will be for a little bit yet. I am working on some other videos around some of my custom work that I have going on. We'll see how those goes. I had a, a failed hammer, unfortunately, that had a lot of hours into, but thankfully the customer and a longtime subscriber of the channel was very super gracious with me to allow me to continue to uh, work even more and take another stab at it is good, which is always good once, you know, you're out 50 hours on chasing work and it's poof, <laughs> gone in the quench. So this time around, I might actually film a video around that while I'm forging the thing. It was a wrought iron hammer uh, with the faces welded in and a decorative acanthus leaf on the sides. So hopefully that content will be coming out after all this other type stuff. We'll have to see how it goes see how it goes and uh, see how the rest of the year goes for us. But that's what's new. That's what's coming up. Something to look forward to. I hope you'll look forward to it. Hope you'll watch the videos. Yep. We can take every view we can get. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, channel's coming up on 60,000 subscribers, so that's pretty awesome. We're just around 400 away or so, I think it is four or 500 subscribers away from 60,000 subscribers, which is mind boggling. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, well, we, we just keep trudging along. Maybe we'll do something special when we get to 100K, huh? Get up to 100,000 subs, as seems to be the usual thing. Oh, I'm already giving away Anvil, so I don't know what I'm gonna have to, <laughs> usually people do like a giveaway, right? Once they get to a certain size, so. Yeah, that's what it is. Made from cheese or something. Like it's got to be something cheap. It's got to be something cheap and easy and easy to ship. <laughs> Man. Man, I saw a, I saw one guy and just seen this. I was watching this YouTube channel and this dude, he shared for a brief second like what he made last month. And uh, he does like covers like news and some other stuff. And he's been growing, this channel's been growing. And uh, he just shared like a blip of what he made in last month. And he made 200 grand in AdSense. And I just like, when I saw that, I was like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I like, you know what I could do with 200 grand? Oh, it could be like power hammers for everyone, every weekend, you know, like, Something like that. Gee whiz. We have several votes for you wear a tilt at 100K. Oh, no. There had to be a lot more $100 super chats for that to happen. And someone's probably going to have to buy me a kilt. And then I probably still, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. No, I do have, I, I am part Scottish, Irish, and German. So that is my makeup and my bloodline. So I could possibly wear a kilt, but. Yeah, I don't know. Kind of anti-kilt. My these chicken legs don't even like being in shorts. <laughs> I could, I could. <laughs> Y'all keep it up. One day it'd just be pantsless. <laughs> pantsless forging time with Roy. You know, <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> Silence all you kilt-wearing people out there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the super chat board will be for. It'll be to put them back on. And I'll have a name price <laughs> sitting up there. Like unless we hit this total, the pants stay off. <laughs> yeah, they just leave. We go down to having zero people in the stream permanently. <laughs> no, only the most dedicated. Only Ben Tombs, he'd be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a different channel. <laughs> no, that's a different channel. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, man. So much good stuff. So much good stuff. Well, I wish I could hang out with you all all evening. Again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream and all the, all the jack wagonry that followed 
from hitting the go live button. <laughs> and I hope you guys are all good and uh, that you guys have a safe and blessed weekend and that you have a safe and blessed upcoming week. And um, yeah, till next time, we'll see you. Have a great day. Bye everyone.